Hi, I'm Pat Cleary, President and CEO of the National Association of Professional Employer Organizations. Professional employer organizations, or PEOs, are the best kept secret in the small and medium-sized business space. 200,000 small businesses use a PEO to help them with payroll, benefits, and compliance assistance. During COVID-19, small businesses have reached out to their PEO and the PEO has helped them steer through the PPP loans and the application process and the labyrinth of rules around paid leave, working from home, return to work. Companies who use a PEO have higher growth rates, lower turnover, and twice the survival rates of companies that don't. They have higher revenue and they have employees who are generally more satisfied and more engaged. So we're glad you're watching this today, that you're one of the 200,000 businesses that use a PEO, and welcome. Now let me turn this over to Seth Peretta and Malcolm Slee of the Groom Law Group, our outside counsel, and their presentation on the PPP loan process and loan forgiveness process. Thank you, Pat. On behalf of my colleague, Malcolm Slee, and myself, Seth Peretta, we're very happy to be here today to talk about the Paycheck Protection Program, or the PPP. Uh, we're going to begin today by talking about the program generally, and then we're going to move into a discussion around the forgiveness process. For many of you, you may be pretty far along in your PPP experience, having received a loan, uh, perhaps uh, spending those dollars, and now looking forward uh, to the forgiveness process. So we're going to talk a little bit about that forgiveness process. We're also going to talk about the PPPFA. This is a new piece of federal legislation that was enacted and signed into law by President Trump on June 5th. Um, this law was intended to liberalize many of the rules uh, that govern this program. They were intended by Congress to make sure that you as a borrower were able to maximize both your use of those proceeds, but also the amount that may be eligible for forgiveness. We're going to talk about a fair number of things that you should think about in connection with the recent enactment of this new law. This new law provides a lot of opportunities, but it also provides some interesting decision points that you'll need to think about as you move forward uh, over the next several weeks and months in connection with your PPP loan. I'm going to then turn it over to my colleague, Malcolm Slee, and he and I will be talking about the new forms. These are revised forms to reflect both the PPPFA's enactment, but also uh, the SBA and Treasury issued some simplified or easy forms. These are forms that for qualifying or sort of eligible borrowers will allow the borrower to file simpler or easier forms when seeking forgiveness. So think like a 1040EZ. These forms are designed to reduce the extent of burden and time spent completing your loan forgiveness applications. And then we're going to finish our session today by focusing on our don't forgets. These are things that you shouldn't forget as you move forward with your PPP experience. These are things designed to make sure that you are properly submitting your loan forgiveness application, that you're using the right form, that you're maximizing your forgivable amounts. And as we'll talk about towards the end of our session, that you understand and appreciate and utilize the value of your PEO. They're there to help you, uh, and they have a lot of folks who should be well-suited to give you guidance and assistance as you move forward with your PPP experience. So we're going to begin today by talking about the Paycheck Protection Program generally. This is based on the law that was passed back in March called the CARES Act. The CARES Act provides low interest loans to certain qualifying small businesses for use in meeting certain eligible expenses. Malcolm, in terms of how PPP loan proceeds can be used, I understand they can be used for both sort of eligible payroll as well as eligible non-payroll costs. But could you provide a little bit more information as to sort of what's encompassed in each of those categories? Sure. So payroll costs encompass standard things like employee compensation, uh, you know, bonuses and commissions probably will be picked up in that as well. Also things like employer contributions to a health plan, employer contributions to a retirement plan. Non-payroll costs, uh, the things you're going to be able to spend your loan proceeds on are things like mortgage payments for your business property, uh, rent payments if your business has a lease, uh, certain utility payments like water, electricity, internet, perhaps transportation costs. Thank you, Malcolm. In terms of what might be the actual sort of maximum loan amount that a borrower can receive 
is it an unlimited amount of money or is it capped at a, a fixed dollar amount? Sort of how much can a borrower get when a borrower is seeking a PPP loan amount? Well, again, because the PPP was really intended to be primarily tied to payroll costs, Congress set it up so that your maximum loan amount would be two and a half times whatever your monthly payroll costs looking back at the your payroll costs in 2019. I understand that one of the really big significant benefits of the PPP is that in addition to having a very, very low interest rate, that certain amounts are eligible for forgiveness, meaning that those amounts are sort of converted from a loan into a grant. But I also understand that the forgivable amount can be subject to reduction for really two things. One is a reduction in FTE or full-time equivalent headcount, as well as if a borrower reduces salary or hourly wages below certain thresholds. Can you give us a little more understanding as to sort of how these reduction factors work? You're right. I mean, one of the great things about the PPP program is that if you use your uh, loan proceeds to effectively to, to pay your employees, um, there's a good opportunity to have the loan amount forgiven, either partially or entirely. And it, it converts into a, a grant, which is a, a fantastic uh, feature of this particular program. But Congress did want to make it clear that you had to actually maintain your uh, workforce. You couldn't use your loan proceeds and then lay people off or cut their salaries. So they wrote into the CARES Act uh, certain penalties where if your employee headcount is reduced or you reduce salary or hourly wages after you get your loan, that can reduce the amount that's potentially forgivable under the PPP. Congress, when they came up with the PPP, Again, the primary purpose for this program was to encourage uh, businesses to maintain their employee workforces and to maintain wages and salary. That's really what Congress wanted you spending your loan proceeds on. So they wrote into the uh, CARES Act itself uh, some restrictions where if you reduce your employee headcount or you reduce uh, employee salaries or wages after you get your loan proceeds, you effectively have to take a penalty. It can reduce the amount of your uh, PPP loan that is potentially forgivable. So very important to keep that in mind. On June 5th, 2020, Congress enacted a subsequent piece of legislation, the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, or PPPFA. It greatly liberalizes various aspects of the existing PPP. One important aspect of the PPPFA is that it basically extends the period of time during which borrowers can use their loan proceeds as well as seek forgiveness on those amounts. Malcolm, my understanding is that uh, whereas the original PPP allowed for an eight-week loan forgiveness covered period, that that period has been extended to 24 weeks. Can you give us a little bit of understanding as to how this rule applies, both with, with respect to uh, current borrowers, or as well as perhaps borrowers that received their loans on or after June 5th? Sure. So this is really good news for borrowers. Um, keep in mind that the potential amount of your PPP loan that is forgivable is largely going to be based on your ability to spend down that loan during a covered period after you received the loan. Under the original CARES Act, you had eight weeks to spend down your loan proceeds. So a lot of borrowers were finding it difficult to do that, um, and particularly to allocate their loan proceeds towards payroll costs if they had had a reduction in their business activities. What Congress did with the PPP Flexibility Act is they expanded that uh, period for which you can spend down your loan proceeds from eight weeks to 24 weeks. So that's going to give borrowers more time to spend their loan proceeds and potentially increase the amounts that will be forgivable. Now, if you got your loan prior to June 5th, you have the option of sticking with the original eight-week period. So there will be some businesses out there they got their loan, they've been planning on trying to spend as much of it as, as they can within eight weeks. Um, if you want to, you can continue to use that eight-week period. Again, if you got the loan prior to June 5th, there's no problem in doing that. But you also have the option now of expanding your, your uh, covered period to 24 weeks, and there are going to be a lot of borrowers that are going to want to take advantage of that. Malcolm, I understand many questions have arisen in connection with this new uh, statutory provision. Um, for example, folks have asked whether they could have a loan forgiveness period that is longer than eight, but less than 24. So say I'm a borrower and I didn't get to spend all of my proceeds by the end of week eight, but I think I can use them all up by the end of week 12. Um, 
can they choose a loan forgiveness period that is uh, uh, more than eight and less than 24 weeks? Unfortunately, you cannot. Um, if you're a borrower, and again, if you got your loan prior to June 5th, you can you can have an eight-week period or you can have a 24-week period, but you can't pick and choose a period between eight weeks and 24 weeks. As previously discussed, a borrower's forgivable amount is subject to reduction uh, if they reduce employee headcount or salary and hourly wages below certain thresholds. Thankfully, the PPP did allow borrowers to avoid those reductions if they're able to restore their headcount or salary and hourly wages by a certain date and time. Helpfully, the PPPFA sort of has given us an additional period of time. Uh, Malcolm, can you explain how this rule is intended to work? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, as we talked about, you, your, your potential amount of your loan forgiveness can be reduced if you cut your uh, headcount or salary and wages after you got your loan. But Congress did recognize that there were going to be scenarios where businesses um, might have cut headcounts or, or salaries or wages. Um, when the pandemic hit, a lot of businesses obviously moved quickly. Some of them had to make changes to their workforce. So they wanted to provide a little bit of relief for borrowers. And what the uh, CARES Act originally provided was that if you were able to restore your headcounts or salary and wages, by June 30, you could avoid a reduction to your forgiveness amount. A lot of borrowers said, you know, we love the concept, but it's gonna to be tough for us to get back to full employment by June 30, that's not giving us a lot of time. So thankfully, when Congress enacted the Flexibility Act, they expanded that deadline. So borrowers now have until December 31st of this year to fully restore uh, employee headcount and salary and wages. And if they do that, they may be able to avoid a reduction to their forgiveness amount. One other aspect of the PPP that we've not yet discussed uh, is in addition to various safe harbors, uh, SBA and Treasury came out with a series of exceptions that can be utilized in the case of FTE reductions to avoid a corresponding reduction in the forgivable amount. Those were really important exceptions and very welcome news. For example, if a borrower makes a qualifying offer of employment to rehire an individual, but, but that individual declines the opportunity for employment. Um, that allows the borrower to effectively avoid a reduction. Similarly, if an employee voluntarily resigns, voluntarily reduces their hours, or is terminated for cause, the employer will not be sort of penalized when it comes to calculating their forgivable amount. The PPPFA included a couple other exceptions um, and one I think that is really important for borrowers because it may be a very, very viable way for most borrowers to avoid a reduction to their forgivable amount based on a reduction in employee headcount. Malcolm, can you give us a little bit of understanding as to sort of how this new exception may be helpful? Yeah, and I agree, Seth. I think this is, you know, a uh, great, great action by Congress that is really going to help borrowers. Basically, what they said was that if you can't get back to the same level of business activity that you were at on February 15th, prior to the pandemic, by the end of the year, if you reduced your workforce or reduced uh, salary or wages, you won't face a potential penalty with regard to your loan forgiveness amount. So this is something that I think a, a lot of borrowers are going to be able to rely on. It's very good news. So the last provision we want to talk about in the PPPFA is a very welcome provision which is, as mentioned, the PPP had a provision in the CARES Act that effectively foreclosed or prohibited borrowers who obtained forgiveness on their loan proceeds from exercising a opportunity to defer the employer's share of Social Security taxes uh, into 2021 and 2022. Thankfully, when Congress enacted the PPPFA, they eliminated that restriction. So borrowers can now utilize that employment tax deferral opportunity just like any other employer. So now we're going to move on to the next part of our discussion, which is the actual forgiveness application process and forms. And for that, I'm hoping Malcolm will walk us through sort of the application and its components. Um, and unfortunately, it's not the easiest application for most borrowers to complete, although thankfully SBA and Treasury have heard that critique, and I think they've uh, recently put out some guidance and some new forms that may be very helpful to some of the borrowers watching this video. 
Yeah, for today's purposes, we're going to keep it uh, really high level because we could easily, you know, spend a couple of hours going through the loan forgiveness application and we don't want to put you through that. Um, it's extremely complicated. It's extremely time consuming. Um, and if you pull up the loan forgiveness application itself, you'll see uh, there's an application. There's a Schedule A that you have to work through. There's a Schedule A worksheet that you have to go through requires you to uh, document your employees that you had during the covered period that you were spending down your loan proceeds. It requires you to determine whether or not uh, certain employees were, were actually working as full-time employees, because again, that's gonna play into whether or not your loan proceeds are gonna be fully forgivable. Um, so I think it's very important for borrowers who are anticipating applying for loan forgiveness to pull out the application, get familiar with it as quickly as possible because you will soon see there's a lot of uh, employment and payroll data you need to collect and a lot of uh, decisions you're going to have to make as you fill out the application. Um, for example, if you have reduced your workforce, you're gonna have to think about, does it make sense for me to uh, bring people back so I can try and maximize the uh, amount that might be forgivable uh, with regard to my PPP loan? Thank you, Malcolm. It's very helpful. Uh, and a bit of other further good news, uh, in addition to the enactment of the PPPFA, SBA and Treasury did issue simplified or easy forms, which allow certain borrowers to effectively seek forgiveness uh, using significantly less data and probably burden and time. Um, this was largely in response to those concerns or critiques that I mentioned uh, previously which was that the current general base form was pretty complicated and required the collection and analysis of a lot of wage and uh, payroll and employment data. So Malcolm, can you walk us through basically which borrowers might be able to use these new simplified EZ forms? Yep, sure thing. And I agree, Seth. I think this is a, a great development for borrowers, uh, potentially is going to make everybody's lives a lot easier the borrowers that are eligible to use the EZ form, first of all, if you're a self-employed individual or an independent contractor or a sole proprietor without employees, um, effectively you didn't uh, claim that you were paying any employees when you applied for your loan, you should be able to use the EZ form. Um, if you're an employer that didn't cut your employees' wages, uh, if they made less than $100,000 by more than 25% during the covered period, and you didn't reduce the, um, the number of your employees or the average hours of your employees during the covered period, again, highly likely you're going to be able to use the EZ form. And then lastly, if you didn't reduce uh, salary and wages and you were affected by the pandemic, so you weren't able to operate during the covered period uh, during which you were using your loan proceeds as you were back in uh, February of this year, which I think is going to describe many, many borrowers out there. Uh, you should be able to use the EZ form as well. So it's a great development. Borrowers, you know, that use the EZ form, they're not going to have to list out all their employees on their loan forgiveness application. They're not going to have to list out individual employee compensation. They're not going to have to figure out which of those employees were full-time employees. It should make borrowers' lives much, much easier. And now we're going to focus on our don't forget section of the presentation. This is our final section, and it's going to be focused on things that you as a borrower should keep in mind as you move forward in completing your forgiveness loan applications. The first one, and it's really important, is that you talk to your lender early on in the process. Under the SBA and Treasury guidance, your lender can use its own materials for purposes of the loan forgiveness application process. They may ask for different information than what's on the SBA Treasury loan application itself, both as to the extent of inf information, the scope of information, the type of information that's requested. So to minimize the amount of burden, cost, and time you're gonna to have to spend completing your loan forgiveness application, talk to your lender first. It probably will save you some time. Malcolm, what's our second don't forget? We talked a little bit earlier about if you got your loan before June 5th, you have the option of uh, spending down your loan proceeds over either an eight week period or a 24 week period. Uh, certainly there's gonna be a lot of borrowers out there that are gonna to wanna to use that 24 week period, it gives you more time to spend your loan proceeds on payroll costs. Uh, that should increase the amounts that are potentially forgivable. 
But there are some businesses out there that have been planning based on that eight week period after they got their loan. So you're gonna have to work through the pros and cons of using either the eight week period or the 24 week period. Another don't forget is don't forget to consider whether you can use the simplified or the easy loan application. It's important to think about this because one, if you can, it'll save you a lot of time. On the other hand, if you try to use it and actually you aren't eligible, it's pretty likely your lender is going to decline to offer forgiveness on the amounts that you've requested. So think carefully, make sure you meet the eligibility criteria. As Malcolm mentioned, there are three sort of categories of borrowers that are able to use that simplified form. If you fit in one of those categories, congratulations, you've won. Uh, the process of seeking forgiveness on your loan proceeds should be significantly easier and faster. So for folks out there who think they may be eligible for use of those forms, uh, definitely read the instructions and think about whether you can fit into that criteria. Even if you're using the new EZ application, uh, you want to be thinking about the employment, payroll, and business expense data that you're going to need to go through the loan forgiveness application. That information is going to be needed regardless of whether you're using the EZ form or the original loan forgiveness application form. If you're using the EZ form, you won't necessarily have to enter all this data on your application, but you're still going to need it. Some of the information has to actually be submitted to your lender with your application. Some of it you've got to retain uh, in the event that SBA decides to audit you uh, down the line to make sure you are using your loan proceeds correctly. So this is very important that you start thinking about this information and how you're going to collect it. One other important don't forget is don't forget to think about the safe harbors and the exceptions that are available to you to help maximize your forgivable amount. Uh, as we mentioned earlier in this presentation, your forgivable amount is subject to reduction if you reduce your FDE headcount or your salary and hourly wages for your employees below certain thresholds. These safe harbors and exceptions are a very good and useful way to try to maximize your forgivable amount, but they're pretty detailed and whether you fit within them will turn a lot on your own facts and circumstances. So work very carefully with your advisors, your accountant, maybe your PEO to think through whether or not these safe harbors and exceptions are available to you to help maximize your forgivable amount. As we talked about earlier, one of the great aspects of the Flexibility Act is that it expands the availability of that social security payroll tax deferral, even if you've got your PPP loan amounts forgiven. So that is great news for borrowers. You wanna be sure you're uh, utilizing that new benefit to the fullest extent. So you definitely wanna be talking to your PEO and or your payroll provider about how you can use that deferral program. One really important don't forget is don't forget to keep all the information necessary to substantiate both your use of your loan proceeds in a proper manner, as well as the amounts for which you sought forgiveness. So after you've completed your loan forgiveness application and you've submitted it, and after your lender has approved your application and forgiven your amounts, you really need to keep all this information. Why? Because SBA and Treasury might very well show up on your doorstep in the next month, next several months, or perhaps next few years, and seek to audit you to make sure that you used your loan proceeds properly and that the amounts for which you sought forgiveness were actually improperly incurred. Now for borrowers who received loans in excess of $2 million, and that includes borrowers and their affiliates taken together. So if you have parent co and sub co or brother sister co's and in the aggregate, you receive $2 million or more dollars in loans, you will be audited. SBA and Treasury issued guidance saying we are going to audit all folks who received loans in excess of $2 million, and that's based on the disbursement date. So for, if you're in that category, if you're one of those borrowers who got in excess of $2 million, including your affiliates, you will be audited and you will need to have the information necessary to substantiate both proper use and a proper submission of the forgivable amounts. So don't forget, keep your documents, it's important. And our last don't forget, but a really important don't forget is don't forget to partner with your PEO. These are really challenging times and I'm sure you're really focusing on a lot of important things with respect to your business. As it relates to your PPP loan application process, your PEO is there to help you. They have experts, they've got tax experts, they've got accountants, they've got data. Uh, and more importantly, they have your back. 
So as you have questions and as you move through the, through the process, please don't hesitate to reach out to your PEO. So thank you, Seth and Malcolm, for a great presentation on what's very complicated PPP loan application and loan forgiveness process. The most important thing I took away from that was at the very end when they said, call your PEO. Your PEO is going to help you through this. They're going to be a resource. They've got your back.